Recent discoveries have uncovered dates, agendas, and goals that connect the Jesuits to a massive deception for the purpose of a multifaceted end-time delusion. The design of this deeply hidden plot has been to change the perception of the masses regarding the authority of the Bible, the correct shape of the earth, the layout of the universe, and the Creator's position in it. This change in perception has prepared minds for the overwhelming delusion to come upon the world under the first woe, the fifth trumpet, prophesied in Revelation chapter 9. This delusion will be a demonic attack under the pretext of an alien invasion. Reportedly, Vladimir Lenin observed, A lie told often enough becomes the truth. This quote is discovered within the belief of most. The Earth is a sphere. It spins through space while orbiting the Sun, hurtling thousands of kilometers an hour inside our Milky Way galaxy. So ingrained is this belief, if one speaks of the words flat Earth, listeners snicker. The mental reflect of a flat plane from which a person might fall into an infinite space creates this disrespect. A globe Earth, because unproven, is pseudoscience, yet believed worldwide and passed from generation to generation, and any who question it is mocked and ridiculed. For millennia, well-educated people believed the Earth was flat and placed at the center of the universe enclosed there with a protective covering. In the early 16th century, Nikolai Copernicus introduced a different model of the universe in which the Sun lay at the center and the Earth revolved around it. Copernicus' heliocentric model is taught today while the earlier geocentric model has been utterly rejected. Less than a hundred years later, Galileo was persecuted by the Catholic Church for promoting Copernicus theory and forced to recant his beliefs and spend the last years of his life under house arrest. Galileo's persecution for promoting heliocentrism is surprising as the Catholic Church initially supported Copernicus theories. Consider the following facts. 1. While some sources claim Copernicus never took the vows of a priest, he was a cleric and never married. Furthermore, the fact that in 1537, King Sigismund of Poland put his name on the list of four candidates for the vacant episcopal seat of Ermland makes it probable that, at least in later life, he had entered the priesthood. When Pope Paul III sought Copernicus for advice on how to reform the calendar, Copernicus at first demurred to answer. Later, he wrote a series of letters to the Pope containing accurate observations that actually served 70 years later as a basis for the working out of the Gregorian calendar. 3. For a long time, Copernicus refused to publish his beliefs on a heliocentric universe. Finally, in 1531, he published a brief abstract stating his theory in seven axioms. From this, the concept spread rapidly. 4. Two years later, Albert Windmanstadt lectured on the Copernican model before Pope Clement VII, an action for which he was richly rewarded. 5. In 1536, Cardinal Schoenberg, who was Archbishop of Capua, urged Copernicus to fully publish his theory or, at the least, have a copy made at the Cardinal's expense. 6. Between 1539 and 1541, Copernicus published and distributed a 66-page letter and a preliminary chapter. 7. 
Copernicus explained in a letter to Pope Paul III that he finally yielded to the insistent urging of Cardinal Schoenberg, Bishop Gies of Com, and other knowledgeable men, and agreed to publish his manuscript. Copernicus' theory of a heliocentric universe was well known at the upper strata of the Catholic Church in his lifetime. While he preferred his theories published after his death, he ultimately agreed to publish his manuscripts on the persistent appeals of high church officials. Catholics were not first to reject Copernicus' views, for they themselves admit Opposition was first raised against the Copernican system by Protestant theologians for biblical reasons. The Catholic Church advanced Copernicus' heliocentric model, constantly urging him to spread it abroad, together with other theories that opposed the sacred scriptures. The necessity to change public conception from an accurate belief in a flat, enclosed earth to a false belief grew slowly. With sapient baby steps, the whole world would become amenable to the final delusion of an alien invasion under the first woe. The Catholic hierarchy had the perfect opportunity to lay groundwork for a global deception to culminate in this earth's final generation. This deception required a globe Earth spinning throughout the vast reaches of space, space inhabited by aliens and other sentient life forms. These contrivances created doubt in the Bible, putting science ahead of Scripture, which advises mankind the Earth is enclosed and unmoving. They also place the Creator far away from His creation by presenting a universe unimaginably vast. To engineer this transformation in belief, the newly created Society of Jesus, commonly known as the Jesuits, became the agents of change. The Roman Catholic Church was waging war on the new Protestantism believers having come from their own system, while Copernicus was resisting appeals to publish his theory of a heliocentric solar system. Under the approval of Pope Paul III, the Jesuit order was established in 1540, and Copernicus dedicated his book, Revolutions of the Heavenly Bodies, to this very same Pope. This newly formed order, the perfect instrument to implement a clandestine operation for the Pope of Rome, began changing the public perception of the authority of the Scriptures, the Earth and the Creator, through the Copernican Revolution. By deliberately teaching their followers to invite demonic spirits into their human spirits, the Jesuits exposed what manner of mankind each truly was. The Jesuit founder, Ignatius of Loyola, had taught all members of the Society of Jesus certain spiritual exercises which made them practical, mind-controlled slaves to Satan. They were to daily become as corpses or cadavers, that they unhesitatingly obey the will of their superiors. In opening the mind to the influence of demons, these Jesuits brought in a spirit of malevolence, a demonic intelligence that was unprecedented in Catholicism. Now, satanically controlled, the Jesuit priests became successful in every evil endeavor. They became infamous for their skill at deception and subterfuge their ability to infiltrate governments and institutions of learning, their standing as advisors to kings and new leaders in education, the very influence they wielded was tantamount to becoming humanly insurmountable. Working through government entities and in the field of world education, 
they guide scientific research to further their own ends and present the biggest lie of all time, a globe Earth. Following Copernicus publications, it is probable the Jesuit order has produced more astronomers than any other demographic in Europe. That, ostensibly, a religious order should produce so many scientists should cause surprise. However, as these scientists have focused nearly exclusively in but one area, this gives us reason to question. Upon rejection of the sacred scriptures, which teach us Earth is a fixed, immovable object under a protective covering, a nefarious foundation was laid. Atop this were built perversions designed to force humanity to doubt the very word of our father Yahuwah. With the biblical geocentric model rejected, a new explanation was required. A globe Earth, its orbit of the sun for millions of miles every year, illimitable realms of space with billions of galaxies, each composed of billions of stars with worlds innumerable. All this became necessary to explain the new heliocentric model of the universe, and mankind, over a short time, lost his divine significance. Thereafter was created an environment within which the writings of Charles Darwin found a receptive audience. Once science showed the Bible wrong, the disparager then diverged from her religious guise altogether. Anything suddenly became possible. There was nothing above question, including how the Earth seemed to appear in the vastness of space with all else and the existence of extraterrestrials. The Big Bang Theory is, today, the leading explanation about how the universe began. At its simplest, it talks about the universe as we know it, starting with a small singularity, then inflating over the next 13.8 billion years to the cosmos that we know today. Priest Andrew Pinsent holds advanced degrees in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome as well as a doctorate in particle physics from Oxford. In January 2015, he wrote, Being both a priest and a former particle physicist at CERN, I am often asked to give talks on faith and science. Quite often, young people ask me the following question, How can you be a priest and believe in the Big Bang? To which I am delighted to respond, We invented it! Or more precisely, priest Georges Lemaitre invented the theory that is today called the Big Bang and everyone should know about him. The author of the Big Bang Theory was none other than the Jesuit trained priest Georges Lemaitre. On October 28, 2014, Sarah Kerr reported, Speaking to members of the Pontifical Academy of Science, the Pope said it is possible to believe in both, insisting God was responsible for the Big Bang from which all life evolved. Non contraddice l'intervento creatore divino, ma lo esige. L'evoluzione nella natura non contrasta con la nozione di creazione, perché l'evoluzione presuppone la creazione degli esseri che si evolvono. Follow from cause to effect. 1. Without a globe Earth circling the Sun through the far reaches of space, we do not have the Big Bang. 2. Without the Big Bang, we do not have evolution. 3. Without evolution, we are more likely to accept creation as an act of intelligent design by a divine creator. 
The Roman Catholic Church does, in fact, accept evolution. Acceptance of evolution and its integral law of survival of the fittest gave rise to the bloodbaths of the 20th century in which millions lost their lives. Numerous researchers have established incontrovertible connections between the Vatican and the Nazi Party. Regardless of the level of collaboration between the Vatican and the Nazis, what happened after World War II is even more significant. Operation Paperclip smuggled hundreds of Nazi scientists, including top SS officers on trial for war crimes, into the United States for use in America's Cold War space race. One of these Nazi Party members, Werner von Braun, was promoted to head up NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Under Operation Paperclip, some 350 German scientists and former intelligence agents were given visas and well-paying jobs. Many of these scientists had questionable pasts. Braun himself had been an active member of the Nazi Party, and his colleague at NASA, Dr. Hubertus Strugold, a specialist in aviation medicine, had performed experiments on concentration camp inmates. The purpose of this massive and illegal undertaking appears to have been for the establishment of a worldwide authority on all things relating to space and astronomy. NASA became the public face of space. It has long acted as a front providing an unsuspecting world with pseudoscience legitimized by the backing of the U.S. government. NASA is its own monopoly. It controls the dissemination of public information on astronomy while hiding facts it does not want the public to know. While many countries and universities have observatories, Always it is the statements, photographs, and discoveries of NASA that make the news headlines. With NASA in charge of the flow of astronomical information to the public, it appears the Vatican has remained a central player in the truly accurate astronomy not being released to the public. For hundreds of years, the Vatican has owned more telescopes and observatories than any organization, private university, or government. NASA and the Vatican jointly own Lucifer, the world's largest binocular telescope. According to the official Vatican website, the Vatican Observatory is one of the oldest astronomical institutes in the world. And yet, where are the photographs? Where are the news releases of the latest discoveries? Precisely what have the Jesuit astronomers been doing for the last 500 years? Only they know. NASA's public release of information promoting the idea of an expanding, thus ever larger universe of incomprehensible size has led to the supposition there must be alien life on other planets. After all, if the Big Bang produced life on Earth, why couldn't intelligent life have evolved elsewhere? In combination with Hollywood and the science fiction genre, NASA has created an environment in which contact with extraterrestrial life forms is both fearful yet desirous. A recent book may hold the key to understanding the final steps in this long conspiracy to delude the final generation. Authors Tom Horn and Chris Putnam recently published a mind-boggling book in which they allege the Vatican actively seeks extraterrestrial life with their new Lucifer telescope. The book Exo Vaticana, Petrus Romanus, Project Lucifer and the Vatican's astonishing plan for the arrival of an alien savior asserts the Vatican is waiting for an extraterrestrial savior. 
In researching their book, Horn and Putnam were granted permission to visit the observatory on Mount Graham, which hosts the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope, VAT, in September 2012. Not only were they able to discuss the study of deep space with the Jesuit astronomers there, but they also gained access to one of the top Vatican astronomers in Rome. Horn, said brother Guy Consolmagno, who has also been called the papal astronomer, told the authors some astounding information during five interviews. He says without apology that very soon the nations of the world are going to look to the aliens for their salvation, said Horn. Consul Magno also gave the authors private Vatican documents which reveal much of the thinking of high-level theologians and astronomers within the Church. Horn said these documents show that they believe that we are soon to be visited by an alien savior from another world. These statements are not that shocking when the Vatican's ever-evolving stance on science and space is understood. On May 12, 2014, Pope Francis expressed a willingness to baptize extraterrestrials who indicated a desire for baptism. While the comment was clearly tongue-in-cheek, it made international headlines, this one crowing, Cool Pope is so cool that he is willing to baptize Martians. The net effect? It removed the idea from science fiction and transferred it to the realm of possibility. Talking about it as if it were possible gives rise to minds more accustomed to the construct. After the Vatican hosted a five-day conference on extraterrestrial life, Catholic priest Jonathan Morris appeared on U.S. Fox News to answer some questions. How would it change the church's teaching then? Well, you, if you consider yeah. for a moment, if you determine that there is a extraterrestrial life there. Well, uh, one thing would be fascinating would be not only extraterrestrial life, but if it were extraterrestrial intelligent life forms. That would definitely make us go back and say, maybe our understanding of perennial truths needs to be updated. Now, the way we look at it is this. It's not about whether or not God was the creator, whether how, but rather how he created. It's not a question of whether original sin, this Adam and Eve story, is true or not, but our understanding of how that played out. So it's, in, it's growing in our understanding of perennial truth. Uh, I think that's an interesting explanation there. And I think also if it were determined, Father, that would be an earthquake, would it not? It would, be, it would be, and uh, especially um, if uh, the Vatican were <laughs> involved in accepting that. Questioning the cosmology of the earth often leads to people doubting scripture and its author and prepares the way for the overwhelming deception prophesied in Revelation chapter 9. Earlier it was stated, the Catholic hierarchy was presented with a perfect opportunity to lay the groundwork for a global deception to culminate in the final generation. The purpose for this intricate, multi-layered deception is to deceive the world's masses and create a desired outcome. To usher the world into a united one-world religion with the Pope reigning supreme, the devil will create a problem. This problem among Earth's citizenry will demand a solution. The solution will have a predetermined outcome. Our wise Creator has revealed this culmination of deception in Revelation 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, 
and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of Yah in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. The key to unlocking this prophecy is found in the phrase bottomless pit, from the Greek word abusos, also translated deep in Luke 8.31. Demons beg to be sent into the swine rather than back to the bottomless pit, the same as the English word abyss. The star fallen from heaven refers to Satan, and when he is given the key to the bottomless pit, he releases hordes of demons onto the earth, appearing as an alien invasion from space, the first woe. These evil angels, as extraterrestrials, will have a distinct appearance and will launch a horrific attack on the earth, lasting for 150 literal days. The trumpets are both a solemn warning and a merciful invitation. They warn probation will soon close and invite all on earth to accept Yahuwah's free gift of eternal life. Those who heed the trumpet's warnings show their loving gratitude by living in compliance to Yahushua's will and are in obedience to all the requirements of His divine law, including the fourth commandment. The trumpets are loving gifts to these living saints of Yahuwah, who, after the close of probation, stand in the sight of a holy Elohim without a mediator. Almost 2,000 years ago, well before a Roman Catholic or Jesuit ever appeared, this series of events was foretold. Does not the amazing foreknowledge of our Father truly strengthen our faith? The righteous will see the trumpets unfold as prophesied, and their courage is strengthened. They are led more steadily to rely on the promises of Him who cannot lie. We know the alien invasion is the manufactured problem. Naturally, a representative of mankind will be chosen to negotiate a peace treaty with these invaders. The solution will be predetermined and under the direct control of Satan himself. Francis, the eighth and final pope, steps forward to negotiate this faux peace. A Jesuit, he has come under the direct control of demons by way of the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. Francis has previously ensured he has sympathetic ties with all religions. Thus will be the logical choice as mankind's representative to establish a peace treaty with these invaders from outer space. This treaty will 1 end the war exactly 150 days after it starts. 2. Place the Pope at the head of the New World Order as mankind's representative. 3. Place the Pope as mankind's savior at the head of a new, unified, one world order and religion. As savior of the world, the Pope will then be in a perfect position to establish one common worship day for all, Sunday, calculated by the Papal Gregorian calendar. 
This unification under one government and one religion will appear logical to those more desirous to have a traitorous peace in a sinful world than to live as is their Creator's way, which brings in eternal life. These want only an easy way out and will join and enforce Satan's new one-world theocracy. All heads of state will hand their sovereignty over to the Pope, as Scripture explicitly spells out. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. This is the event that begins the final struggle between the forces of good and evil. Under threat of continued extraterrestrial aggression, the peoples of Earth will come together to wage relentless war on all those who stand for Bible truth. The conscientious few who place the word of Yah above all earthly mandates will be seen as renegades. Individual religious liberty will be sacrificed for a promised yet finite safety. It is better for a few to perish, it will be argued, rather than the entire world is plunged into suffering under continued alien aggression. When the fifth seal was opened, John saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of Yahuwah and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The answer given is portentous, and foreshadows the intense persecution that shall come upon the righteous under the first woe. During that time, many will be martyred for their faith, as they refuse to unite with the wicked world to worship on a day that pays homage to Satan, the great deceiver. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. For five hundred years, this Jesuit conspiracy has taught the story of a globe Earth, circumnavigating the Sun, itself spinning around the center of an immense galaxy which likewise speeds with over billions of galaxies throughout limitless space. Within this immense realm, surely there are other varieties of intelligent life which inhabit other worlds? These lies climax with the alien invasion prophesied in Revelation 9. The ultimate act will occur when Francis, as Satan's representative, assumes leadership of the world while negotiating a peace treaty on behalf of the human race with the fallen angels. Then Satan will have achieved his long-desired goal to rule the earth. The first wall reveals the opening sequence of events in Satan's endgame to deceive the world. For centuries, the Jesuits have worked to convince the human race the world is round. This Jesuit Pope unites mankind in infamy, all under one government and one religion, none of whom will ever know the beauty of eternal life. And this so very close to the second coming of Yahushua, the world's Messiah. Pope Francis then stands before those left upon the earth as their prime benefactor. The truth is, an extraterrestrial invasion is not possible within an enclosed earth. None would fall for this delusion with scripturally clear and a spiritually correct understanding of the layout of our Earth and Yahuwah's universe. People who know the truth would quickly realize any extraterrestrials appearing in our closed system must then be demons. And any attempt to place the Pope at the head of a unified one-world religion would notoriously fail. 
The Pope would never be accepted as the savior of the human race in a brokered peace treaty with demons. The masses would see Francis colluding with fallen angels and turn from him with abhorrence. And yet, the first woe is just the beginning, just the opening salvo in this climax of the ages. It lays the foundation for an even greater fraud that will follow quickly thereafter. Be sure to watch the next video in this series. The Devil's Masterpiece Counterfeit Second Coming